education, the majority of people, both in the medical community and outside of the medical community, imagine something like this. Imagine pictures from anatomy textbooks, here we see blood vessels of the neck and various other structures. But of course, as many of us know and many of other people know, this is not the, the main part or the largest part of medical education. And in fact, in the past, medical education was very, very different from, from what we have now. Uh, this, once again, is a picture that we already saw today. This is the father of Western medicine, Hippocrates. Uh, here depicted by Peter Paul Ruben. Uh, and uh, in Hippocrates, in the time of Hippocrates, uh, medicine and medical education, the medical profession was very, very different. They didn't have any anatomy textbooks because anatomy was virtually unknown. The structure of the human body was unknown because there was a taboo uh, for uh, necropsies or dissecting human bodies. So the knowledge about the structure of the human body was very, very poor. Um, but the majority of medical theory and medical practice was actually dealing with balance. Uh, the whole theory of, of health and disease was about balance, but well, yeah, it's a different kind of balance, but anyway, that's the illustration. Um, the, the theory was that health means uh, having all the humors, all the different composition of the body, in balance, and if it was out of outside balance, then it caused uh, disease. Now, of course, medical education, medical profession evolved in time with uh, the, the evolving and improving theories of what the human body, how the human body works, and what disease and health actually means. Uh, the ancient theories actually held on for a very long time until the Middle Ages, uh, until the High Middle Ages, where there was, in, in Europe at least, in the Western world, there was a huge revolution when Islamic science and Islamic so science and, and technology coming from Islamic countries, uh, mainly from Persia and, and India, at that time ruled by Islamic uh, dynasties, brought to Europe both the forgotten ancient texts, but also the new technologies, especially in surgery and also in diagnostics and in treatment. Uh, the biggest development, really, of medical education and, and the theories about the human body occurred from the, let's say, 15th or 16th century onward, where in the Western world there's the beginning of experimental medicine, experimental science and experimental medicine as well, where the, our understanding of how human bodies and their human cells later on, how they work, how we can influence their working, improve massively. Nowadays, we know so much about the human body and human cells that it actually becomes too much for the human head. And as many of you will know, that it's really, really difficult to actually learn all those things. Well, here is a nice schematic of the metabolic pathways in virtually each human cell. So here what we see is uh, all the little points there are individual substances and the connecting, uh, the connecting uh, lines are showing enzymatic changes between these substances. So even just looking at basically the names of all the stuff that occurs in, the, uh, in every human cell is already pretty complex. But if we actually zoom out from the picture, in a way, we start seeing that the complexity is much, much bigger. Uh, because this whole picture is not static. All these individual substances change constantly in their concentrations, they influence each other, they influence the enzymes that turn them from one, one substance to another. So this whole picture is actually extremely dynamic, and in different types of cells and different types of situations, the specific picture may look very different. This is further complicated by signaling. So all these pathways that we have are influenced by external and internal, so intracellular and extracellular signaling molecules, which regulate all sorts of processes in the metabolic pathways and elsewhere. This, again, is just a schematic of one individual signal molecule, molecule called CMP, or cyclic adenosine monophosphate, which is just one of so-called second messengers in the cell. And you can see how complex all the processes that this CMP, CMP can influence in the cell uh, is. Now imagine that we have tens, if not hundreds, of such signaling molecules in our cells, in our body, and they all influence each other, they all influence the metabolic pathways that we saw. To further complicate the issue, we have gene expression. 
So our genetic information is differently expressed in different tissues depending on all the previous processes that I just showed, depending on the, the metabolic pathways, the metabolic flux, on the regulation by all the individual signaling molecules. So if we only look at one individual cell in a human body, the complexity is too big to really be understood by any human being. If we take the whole human body, whether in health or in disease, the complexity is much, much bigger because here we have the different cells interacting. And as the previous speaker mentioned, the solution most likely is artificial intelligence. And this, of course, is the, the picture of Hull uh, 9000 from Stanley Kubrick's uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, where the uh, computer, the artificial intelligence, uh, in the end tries to kill the, the crew. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that this is what will happen with the artificial intelligence um, in medicine, but what I do believe will happen is that artificial intelligence and machine learning will change the profession very significantly. Uh, and if we know that the profession will change quite significantly, maybe in a decade's time, maybe even sooner, but I think it's probably going to take at least a decade, we should start thinking how to prepare medical students and future medical professionals, and in fact future healthcare professionals, because this is not just a medical, uh, medical problem, for this future. Now when I was thinking about this problem, what will medicine look like in, let's say, 20 years time, um, the, there was one concept that really came to me, and I will explain how it did, and this is the concept of care. Um, this is a drawing by Paul Clare, um, uh, in angel's care, which I think, just if you look at it, actually shows quite nicely an embrace of the angel around a, a person. Why do I think that care is one of the keys to what medical profession will be in the future? One reason is economic, uh, maybe job-related. Uh, this is a quote from a recent book by David Graeber, who is an anthropologist uh, in London, currently in London at LSE. Um, the book is actually very interesting because in, in Bullshit Jobs, that's the name of the book, um, David Graeber shows quite convincingly that we are already in a position where many, many jobs could be, are basically useless. They could be, if they disappeared, uh, there would be no harm. So we are actually creating artificial employment and as Graeber, uh, as Graeber says, we currently have approximately 50% of all work done worldwide is completely useless. And if it disappeared, the world would be better off probably if we didn't have those jobs. So this is just a polemic with the previous speaker maybe because I don't think that jobs will disappear because there are actually very powerful societal pressure, pressures to keep jobs that are completely useless. Uh, read the book, it's very interesting. But anyway, going back to, uh, going back to care, um, Graeber, when he looks at one of the last chapters, he looks into the future and he says, well, if everything becomes automated, almost everything becomes automated, there's one thing that definitely will not be made, will not be performed by machines, and that's care. Because caring for somebody will never want a robot, will never want a machine to take care of us because it's a fundamentally human thing to do. Now, there are other reasons why I think that care is one of the key topics in the future of healthcare and, and, and medical professions. Um, you may have heard this idea, and of course many of you have studied uh, ethics or have heard about ethics. The science alone, which describes how the human body or the, or the world works, does not give us any ethical prescriptions, doesn't tell us what we should do. There's a famous quote or famous idea by a philosopher, uh, David Hume, who says that what is, so how we describe the world, does not tell us what should be. There's no connection between what is and what should be. These two things are separate. So the other, the another um, advantage or the other important characteristic, important factor in why I think that care is going to be the, uh, the future of, of uh, medical profession is that care actually brings about its own ethic. Uh, unlike biochemistry or unlike pharmacology, which do not have their own ethic, care naturally, when you care about somebody, it brings about a certain ethical stance. And in fact, I want to share two names, two people who I think have done actually quite a lot in different ways into studying what care and, and caring relation between humans means. 
Um, the first one, so on your um, on your left, is um, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, who was a Lithuanian Jewish French philosopher, uh, who basically attempted and some would say succeeded in founding the whole of philosophy based on a meeting between two human beings. So what he tried to do was to say, well, yes. There are all sorts, all parts of philosophy that are very important, but they are all founded on this fact when a, one human being meets another human being and understands the other human being as somebody who may need his or her help. This is where the whole of philosophy, the whole of humanity, actually starts. And I think Emmanuel Levinas and, and the philosophy that comes from, from his work could be one of, the, uh, one of the signposts that could tell us how to develop as physicians, as healthcare professionals, and as humans. Um, the other person is Professor, Professor uh, John Pronto from New York, who looked at care from a slightly different point of view. Nowadays, there are huge numbers of care jobs, jobs that are in care, not only for directly for other people, such as nurses, but things like uh, people uh, who clean the streets, uh, people who uh, clean the corridors, etc. There are a lot of jobs that are necessary, that are basically caring jobs, without which the society would not work. And as many of you will know, and again, it's something that we sort of heard in the previous talk, these jobs are very poorly paid. Even though they are absolutely essential, so removal of rubbish from the streets or from the corridors is, is an absolutely essential job, without which we wouldn't be able to work, we wouldn't be able to, to exist very long. They are the worst paid jobs, and Joe Pronto, John Pronto, who comes from uh, from the uh, from feminism, basically from feminist philosophy, says that one of the reasons why these jobs are so poorly paid is that caring is connected with women. That there's a gender bias which says that caring jobs are only for women, and obviously we don't have to pay them very much because in the hierarchy of society currently that we have, uh, women tend to have less influence, and therefore. The, the whole society is biased against things that are connected with women. Um, she develops a very interesting theory, and I think one of the other key um, directions that we have to take is to disconnect this idea that caring is only for women, that it's only something that women do, and realize that caring is something that we should all do. Now, I started the, the talk, or the title of the talk is The Future of Medical Education, and I said that one of the fundamental new directions is probably going to be care. So you might ask, well, how do we include more care or caring in medical education and the development of healthcare professionals? Well, I don't have the answers yet. Um, I think this is something that we need to work on. But one of the things that I believe could start this idea is maybe changing the paradigm, changing the metaphor that we use in medical education. In most texts in medical education, medical pedagogy, and other types of pedagogy, the metaphor that is used is a metaphor of production. We start with a starting material, a freshman, a student, okay? and we end up with a product, a physician or a nurse, fully qualified. And I believe that if we start changing this paradigm from this production factory that produces physicians and nurses, if we change it, for example, into a metaphor of growth and development, so it's not that we start with starting substance, but we start with somebody who wants to develop, who wants to change, who wants to interact with other people, and to grow into being a physician or being a nurse, we might be on our way to developing a more caring medical and healthcare curriculum. So I don't know when this future comes, where everything or a lot will be done in medicine and healthcare will be done by machines. But I do believe that care is the future not only for medical and healthcare professionals, but for the society as a well. whole.